If you've been watching the show, you've probably seen a pattern that I like games that are far more than what they first appear. Games that push the limits of aesthetic, challenge, of committing to a completely wackadoodle concept. And with this in mind, I want to set our sights on Kid Dracula for the original Game Boy. It's my kind of game because it's more than just a cute spin-off of Castlevania, and it's more than just a sequel, update, remake, of a Japanese-only Famicom game you may or may not have known have ever existed. A total package that's full of surprises, incredibly solid action, wonderful music, aggressive charm, and it joins the ranks of Game Boy updates that managed to stand on their own. Though unfortunately not particularly common or cheap, it's one to keep an eye out for and a must for Castlevania fans. Before the game even starts proper, Kid Dracula's introduction performs an impressive hat trick by all at once outdoing the Famicom version by even having an introduction, establishing the game's charm and humor, and cleverly addressing the fact that it is a remake, or sequel or whatever. Turns out villainous usurper Garamoth is back with a vengeance. Again! You gotta love the way that KD shrugs this off. Self-confidence is an important part of any young Dracula's psyche. It also explains the kid's sudden lack of powers this go-around. Basically, he just forgot him. Just poof, gone. But cut the little guy some slack, he is only 10,009 years old after all. It's not only rightfully silly, it's more clever than anything that's ever happened in the Metroid universe. Like how great would it be if Samus was forced to use the Zero Suit because she just locked the keys in the gunship? Anyway, the kid's troubles don't stop there, adding insult to injury, all of his servants jump ship to hang out with the more powerful Garamoth. Except for capital D Death, you know he's always got Dracula's back. There's a bit of confusion over the true identity of Kid Dracula. Is this the boy version of the big man Dracula himself? Or is this Alucard's first true starring role? Or a different Dracula offspring altogether? The first level features portraits of an older, handsome Dracula, and later an umbrella is mentioned as belonging to, quote, your father. But other than that, Daddy Dracula hardly factors into this game. Unless you take into account that outside of his powers, Kid Dracula does take after his father in more ways than one. There seems to be a consensus that this is Alucard, but I ain't buying it. KD's attack is similar to Alucard's attacking Dracula's curse, but that's a direct reference to the big vamp himself anyway. Alucard can also turn into a bat in Symphony, but really isn't that something all vampires can do? Also, vampires don't age. But I'm just nerding out over here. The kid's identity is never specified because this game don't give a shit. It's only interested in a good old fashioned story about bad versus less bad may be good versus evil. If I could bring this back to our discussion of the cutscenes, this is one place where the game falls short. It's not that they're bad, far from it. I thought the artwork was incredible and they were all pretty funny. It's just that with a whopping three cutscenes, I was left seriously wanting. It wasn't even really much of an ending either. Definitely a bummer to get all the way through this game and not get one last charming cinematic. Maybe they were out of jokes. Though I guess we should count ourselves lucky because this is more than what was present in the Famicom version. There the kiddo just like throws a rock at Garamoth's face or something. Kid Dracula's charm touches more than just the cinematics and character designs though. Levels themselves parody or pay homage to other games. The first level has numerous fun allusions to Dracula's castle that Castlevania fans will no doubt notice. There's a debatable cameo by Splatterhouse's Rick Taylor, the arching lava from Salamander slash Life Force. I'm sure this lightning bolt guy cribs from the same eastern folklore as this guy from Airman Stage. And the fourth level has a fun mashup of Dracula's Castle and Mario 3 with a flying ghost ship. There's no shortage of cute witches, and I can definitely appreciate some cute witches. And Kid Dracula is another showcasing of Konami's weird early 90s obsession with roller coasters. Overall, each level is well thought out and memorable. And that is to say nothing of what may be the best password input screen of all time. Oh my god, this game is too cute, I can't handle it. Oddly enough, Kid Dracula tends to feel more like Mega Man than Castlevania. Symphony was not the series' first departure from its roots, though it's telling that both spin-offs were quick to swap out that stiff jump and the iconic whip for something more responsive. You run around shooting bad guys with your spells, which includes your basic bullet spell, as well as additional powers KD remembers as you progress through the game. Homing, Explosion, Metal Storm, it's quite the selection of attacks, and the ability to shoot up and down is a great addition. Eventually you amass numerous spells, more than you really need, and it becomes a pain to hammer on that select button to cycle through them all. Though you can pause and switch at your leisure, it's a shame the game doesn't just go full Mega Man and give you a pop-up menu to scroll through. 
But at the end of the day, Kid Dracula delivers on the promise of a fun-filled parody, but then flips the script a bit to also deliver a real-deal action platformer. An impressive feat. In between levels, Kid Dracula features a minigame segment that I thought was really cool. All magic spells can be charged up. Hit an enemy with a charged attack spell and they will drop a coin. Upon completing a level, one of those cute witches with a cool hat pops up and gives you the option to either gamble coins to win more coins, or spend 10 coins to play one of four minigames for a chance to beef up your lives. It's a game on a game on a game. You're losing money if you don't play. Not only that, it's a top to bottom improvement over the Famicom version. What is that? A newscaster? <laughs> that ain't cute. These little asides are a clever way to help ease and give you a break from the difficulty of this game, which, make no mistake, gets hard. You might not expect a game with some serious Saturday morning cartoon charm could be so challenging, but Kid Dracula is smarter than you might give it credit for. It's aware the sugary fun times could wear thin, so after a breezy few levels, things start getting tough. And by the end, even action fans will have their work cut out for them. Though this game is super cute and features the word kid in the title, you'd be better off letting any kids in your life instead borrow a copy of Kirby's Dreamland. Unlike the Famicom version, whose difficulty at times feels cheap and due to sloppy development, Kid Dracula is hard because it wants to be. The levels are designed with your powers in mind, and while a lesser game might plop down a basic baddie to fight you, KD excels at making all of the enemies interesting and occasionally funny. Also, stay sharp. Kid Dracula's bosses are always trying to get the last laugh with surprise second forms and from the grave final attacks. Here you'll notice that the mini games exist to justify the stingy lack of health drops and items. None of these things are necessarily bad, but I was shocked at how something this cute could give me such a run for my money. Can't judge a game by its cute cover, I guess. But it's fitting as this game fancies itself a Frankenstein's monster of great action platformers. If you truly want to celebrate this era of action games, you gotta bring the challenge. Though, like many games of the time, Kid Dracula is often hamstrung by its hardware. Typical of most Game Boy games, the screen is a bit cramped, and some sprites, though finely detailed, are so big that dodging enemies and navigating platforms can be quite the challenge. Hit detection feels loose at times, and KD is slow to jump, making some boss fights tough stuff. Health upgrades are peppered throughout the game's eight levels, but you lose them at game over, and one or two extra hits doesn't make a huge difference. The final level and boss fight earn its Castlevania stripes by offering one hell of an endurance. Still, while it's a measure from the legendary challenges presented in the Castlevania games at the time, it's no sleepover pillow fight. Okay, so I've been bringing up the Japanese Famicom version, also known as Akuma Joe Special, Boku Dracula Kun, throughout this review, but for prosperity, let's dig a little deeper. To put it bluntly, North America got the better version, and I would instead recommend importing Wong Paco Graffiti if you're interested in Japanese only chibi spin off Famicom games. But you don't watch me for the short version. Kid Dracula functions as both a remake and a sequel to Akuma Joe Special, but you're really best sticking with the Game Boy version. Akuma Joe Special's biggest problem lies in its extreme complacency and its parody driven ways, basically, expecting credit for just showing up. You've got your underwater level, your ice level, your desert level, your city skyline level. You've seen this all before, and maybe that was the goal, but Kid Dracula gets the point for having it both ways. The screen isn't as cramped in the Famicom version, but the jump is still slow and the hit detection is somehow worse. Akuma Joe Special's difficulty, and yes, it also gets hard, comes more from shoddy craftsmanship. The bat is much tougher to control, the space tube was more a battle against the game's collision priorities than quick thinking and fast fingers. The knockback is far more punishing, the upside down magic can't be manually turned off, and perhaps worst of all, no cutscenes. But it's not an awful game, both these versions are fine, but the Game Boy one feels more complete. I guess with a solid three years between the two versions, maybe Akuma Joe Special was a bit of a trailblazer and cruised on its charm alone. Despite this, we got a rare happy ending for North American localization. We were spared the inferior version of Kid Dracula, and we were the only ones to get Monster Party. Eh, missing out on Wom Paco Graffiti looks less and less like a big deal. I know I talk up soundtracks often in my reviews, so often that it might seem like every game I cover has the best soundtrack ever. But in the many soundtracks I have praised in the eight years I've been doing this, Kid Dracula is absolutely among the best, and maybe the single most underrated soundtrack I've yet discussed. It features some of the greatest and most complicated melodies you can cram into four channels. One of its numerous standouts was so good, I used it in the credits of my very first review. 
And I do mean the Game Boy version. While it does recycle a few songs from Akuma Joe's special, Level 1's theme, for example, it features an almost completely original soundtrack that really outclasses the old stuff. But here's where things get sad. I wish I could tell you more about the sole credited composer Akiko Ito, who apparently had a hand in only four video games before exiting the industry. They worked alongside programmer Yukari Hayano, who I mentioned because they had hands in Operation C, a fine Contra game, and Belmont's Revenge, a great Castlevania game, before also exiting the game industry. In a somewhat cruel twist, most responsible for the Famicom version went on to have long prolific careers with Konami and beyond. I can't even find pictures of these people to show you what they look like. But to wrap up on a somewhat happy note, enter 7314 on the password screen to be treated to what may be the greatest sound test screen ever. There are four Castlevania games on the Game Boy. I've already reviewed the other three. You can watch that video here. But let me just say that Kid Dracula and Belmont's Revenge are the ones to own. They're also better than the majority of the Game Boy Mega Man games too. Unfortunately, it's unlikely Kid Dracula will ever come to the eShop, and if you want a physical cartridge, it's gonna set you back a bit, but KD proves to be more than just a cute spin-off. It's absolutely worth the extra coin for collectors. Thanks so much for watching. This is a Patreon-supported show. Special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, go ahead and check that out, or just keep watching. Uh, check out the other videos, like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. There's social media too, and thanks again for watching. There seems to be a consensus that this is Alucard, but I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing anymore.